I want to follow up a little bit with the Sophie Germain primes and take a look at expressions, formulas, and equations. So you might recognize this as being part of the definition for a Sophie Germain prime. So it's called an expression. Each of these is an expression. And so I want to point out what kind of problems you can expect to see with these. So with this right here, we could say evaluate this expression when p is equal to 3. So you might see a problem like that in algebra class, statistics class, something like that. So that means I'm going to take p equal 3, substitute it in here, and get 2 times 3 plus 1, which is 6 plus 1, or 7. So when I evaluate this expression, when p is equal to 3, I get 7. So here's another expression right here, and I might say something like this. Um, let's say find 2n minus 1 when n is equal to 10. So a very similar type wording for this problem. And so this would be 2 times 10 minus 1, which is 20 minus 1, or 19. So this expression right here has a value of 19 when n is equal to 10. Or I could say find this expression when n is equal to 10, and I would get 19. OK, so how about this? Let's say, let's simplify this expression when a is equal to 3 and b is equal to 4. So then this expression becomes 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is 9 plus 16, which is equal to 25. So if I simplify this expression when a is 3 and b is 4, I substitute those numbers in, and I get 25. OK, here are three very similar problems, but they're equations or formulas. So you see we have an equal sign. So here it says q is equal to 2p plus 1. So a similar kind of um, uh, instruction for this would be find q, whoops, find q if p is equal to 3. So find q if p is equal to 3. Well, q is going to be 2 times 3 plus 1, 6 plus 1, or 7. So here I've taken this formula right here and found q when p is equal to 3. But very similar to this, it's just that this has an equal sign. OK, how about m is equal to 2n minus 1? So let's say, let's um, make this find m when n is equal to 10. So m is going to be equal to 2 times 10 minus 1. Again, 20 minus 1, or 19. So same problem, just worded a little differently. And I've got this as a formula instead of just an expression. OK, let's with this one right here, let's find c if a equals 3 and b is equal to 4. Now, you might recognize this as being the equation that's involved in the Pythagorean theorem, but we'll get to that in just a minute. So that means I'm going to substitute in 3 and 4, so I end up with c squared is equal to 3 squared plus 4 squared. c squared is equal to 9 plus 16. So c squared is equal to 25. Now, if I was working in a triangle and I knew that c was the side in the triangle, it would have to be a positive number. So that would mean that c would be equal to the thing I squared to get 25, or 5. If I was just working in algebra and I didn't know anything else about c, I'd have to put a plus or minus right here. So in any case, this is a look at expressions, equations, and formulas, and the kind of instructions and problems you would see with these. Now I'm going to erase this and come back and show you a couple of common expressions and formulas that you'll see if you go on to take a statistics class or if you go on to take a college algebra or pre-calculus class. So I'll be right back. OK, we're back. So here I've written some kind of common expressions that you're going to see. There's a lot of expressions in mathematics that have this form. 
the difference of two numbers in the numerator and some number in the denominator. Now, what you need to know about the fraction bar is that it works like a grouping symbol. It sets the numerator and denominator apart from each other. And so you can't cross over that unless you divide out common factors. So you want to simplify the numerator first, then the denominator, then divide. So let's just take a look at this problem right here when a is 10, b is 5, and c is 5. So it would look like this, 10 subtract 5 divided by 5. Now you can't cross over and divide 5 into 10 or anything like that just yet. So I need to simplify 10 subtract 5 is 5 divided by 5 is equal to 1. Now here's what you need to do. Try the same problem on your calculator. Make sure that you can work your calculator in such a way that this answer comes out to be 1. If you end up with an answer of 9, you're not using your calculator correctly to do this problem. Very common mistake in statistics, people have trouble with their calculators. So uh, this form right here, a minus b over c, here I've substituted in some values, done the work, I get 1. Try it again on your calculator. When you get to statistics, you'll see an expression that has the same form, a difference of two numbers in the numerator and another number in the denominator. When you get to statistics, this stands for the mean of a sample, and this stands for the standard deviation. And what it's probably going to look like is this, because this is called the z-score. So z equals x minus x bar or over s. So in, in statistics, you're going to be using your calculator a lot to simplify expressions like this. If you get to, if you're going to go on and take pre-calculus, you'll see the expression looks like this. This has one extra added thing to it, and that is function notation. So in order to work this problem, you have to understand function notation also, but the form of this is the same as the form of this. This will be a number, this is a number divided by h, or an algebraic expression, another expression, subtract them, divide by h. When you see it as a formula, it will be a kind of slope of a certain line, m equaled f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. But the most important thing is that you see that this and this have this form to them. And you're going to be doing a lot of work on a calculator, so take some simple numbers like this, work them out by hand, and then try the same thing on your calculator, make sure you get the same result. Okay, I'm going to erase this and come back. We're going to look at the Pythagorean theorem and Fermat's last theorem. So hang on. Okay, we're back. And so uh, here's a little postage stamp with Pythagoras on it. And the Pythagorean theorem says this. If you have a right triangle and the two legs are a and b and the hypotenuse is c, then it's always true that c squared equals a squared plus b squared. And if you have a triangle for which this is true, that must be a right triangle. So you can't have one without the other. So one of the, uh, we already worked one of these problems here when we had c was equal to 5, a was equal to 3, and b was equal to 4. So 25 is equal to 9 plus 16, which is 25. So when we have integer solution, positive integer solutions like this, 3, 4, and 5, then that's called the Pythagorean triple. So if 3, 3 4, and 5 work here, then any multiple of them will work also. So 6, 8, and 10 will work if I multiply each of them by 2 or if I multiply each by 3 and get 9, 12, and 15, that will work. So the, this is one Pythagorean triple right here. And Pythagorean triples are just interesting because they're easy to work. There's another one, um, 5, 12, 13. So 13 squared is equal to 5 squared plus 12 squared. That's 25 plus 144, which is 169, and over here 13 squared, 169. So that's another Pythagorean triple, and any multiple of those three numbers forms another Pythagorean triple. So infinite number of Pythagorean triples, which are um, positive integers that satisfy this equation. So when, when the exponent is 2 right here, you can find an infinite number of positive integer triples like this that will satisfy that equation. Here's Fermat's last theorem. If n is greater than 2, 
in z to the nth equals x to the nth plus y to the nth. See, that looks just like this right here, but, but x, y, and z instead of a, b, and c. And the exponent now is a variable n. So if x, y, and z are um, positive integers or counting numbers, and n is also, once you get above 2 for n, no solutions. There are no positive integers x, y, and z that will satisfy this equation for n equal 3, 4, 5, 6. As far as you want to go, that's for Ma's last theorem. So here's the postage stamp with Sophie Germain. And remember, the Sophie Germain primes are what she's famous for. And then here is a uh, postage stamp with Fermat on it, and it has Fermat's last theorem. And it says, uh, you can read in French, there are no solutions for this equation when n is greater than 2. So if you know what Fermat's last theorem is, you could read this little line in French. Another postage stamp with Fermat's last theorem, and it says not equal to, and it's got Andrew Wiles through it, and he's the first person that proved Fermat's last theorem uh, for, for uh, all cases whatsoever, and that didn't happen until 1995. The first person to solve uh, Fermat's last theorem for a general class of numbers was Sophie Germain with the Sophie Germain primes. So it's kind of interesting that if n is equal to 2 up here, there's just an infinite number of positive integers, triples, that you can find that do this. Once you go above 2, none exists. There is none whatsoever, and that's Fermat's last theorem. And it took a long time for people to actually prove it. So that's a look at expressions, equations, formulas, and then extending it to what we talked about before with Sophie Germain with Fermat's last theorem.